Good morning. Welcome, Hope Nation. It's good to have you with us this morning. Uh, we praise God for you joining us from really all over the United States now and some portions of the world. Uh, thank you for clicking on our service and joining us worshiping this morning. Um, it's our privilege. This is a special day. Um, if you guys can go to that next slide for me, we want to celebrate all the moms and all the women's in our, our congregation, all the women's, all the moms uh, for us, I know. Uh, we want to wish all the ladies at Hope a happy Mother's Day. Whether you have children or not, you've cared for us, you've provided for us, you've nurtured us, you've loved us, and we literally would not be here if it weren't for the ladies in our lives. So thank you so much for all of your love, your care, your hard work. And more than anything, we want to say thank you and uh, that we love you. And uh, we'd just like to pray a special blessing on you this morning. So let's pray together for our moms and those ladies who have cared for us this year. Father, we thank you that you knew exactly what we needed uh, when you created the entire world and everything in it. And Father, we just come before you for all of the, the women in our lives, those ladies that make it so special and unique that help us understand that we are loved, um, that we are needed. And Father, we thank you for your good gift to us in them. And we pray that you bless them this year with your grace, with your peace, and with your power. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Three in one, 
Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, as we come before you, we thank you again. Lord, there is nothing that we can do in this life without you. Even the little mundane activities that we think are are under our control or or that uh, we can do without even thinking or um, spending any time with you. Father, we, we need you, your strength and everything that you are in our lives in that moment, even to make those decisions and do those little things. I pray right now because we need your encouragement and your strength. As we continue to meet outside the walls of the building, Lord, it becomes easier and easier to be distracted by the things of life, by family, by our own feelings of frustration and and anger and angst. And so, Lord, we need to be brought back once again to who you are and how great you are and how we are the body of Christ, not a building of Christ. And that we don't need a building. We need the body. And so this morning, as we gather together, remind us one more time, As we pray for our leaders, we pray for President Trump and Vice President Pence and all those who are in leadership with him in his cabinet and those that are in the science departments, those doctors who are guiding and giving him information to make decisions. And Lord, we ask right now that you would give them wisdom and help them to govern us in a way that is honoring and glorifying to you. And Lord, also as freeing as possible for us to live responsibly to honor and glorify you. We pray for our governor, our city councilman. We pray for those who guide us and care for us here in the state of New Hampshire. We ask that you give them wisdom. Lord, I pray that they begin to open up the state in a way that will allow for the free expression of our our worship of who you are and also, Lord, provide guidance to us so that we we can keep each other safe without um, infecting one another with this virus that could possibly lead some to death. Lord, no matter what, we put our faith and our trust in you and you alone. For you are almighty God and there is no one like you and there is none other. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we will not fear We will rest in peace in your goodness, whether we die here on this earth or whether we are taken when you return in the rapture, we trust in you. This morning, fill us with your peace. Enable us by your power. May we be the witnesses you have empowered us to be in our Jerusalem, our Judea, and the uttermost parts of this world. Bless this service, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Change.
Ages not thy compassion fail not as thou hast been the forever wilt be great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have need Oh, oh. 
never sing. Worthy of all praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, you can open to Psalm 127. That's Psalm 127. That's the one we're going to be studying this morning. And uh, even though this is Mother's Day, this is not a slam against moms or any of the women about vacuums. It just happens to prove a point as we're going into this particular psalm. We have about four, actually about six vacuums at our house. One of the most frustrating things that I find with a bunch of them, two of them are uh, just kind of industrial vacs for the shop and, and woodworking and stuff like that, but the other four are all household ones. And there's nothing more frustrating to me than starting to vacuum the house to kind of pick up some stuff for Marissa or whatever and getting about five or ten minutes in and realizing the vacuum doesn't do a single thing that the, what I thought was actually happening, because I can see some lines in the rug, actually isn't picking up any of the dirt. It's just kind of pushing it around to something else. It's completely useless and good for nothing. And I'm sure that uh, if any of you have tried to do something like that, you would be as frustrated about that as well, and you would say that it was useless and good for nothing. There's probably nothing in life that, is, uh, that frustrates uh, or wastes your time, effort, and resources, um, and especially it irritates when it, it absolutely contributes nothing, robs you of energy, resources, and leaves you more work to do while at the same time stealing any satisfaction that you had gotten anything done at all. We would say that this is completely useless, worthless, and good for nothing. We get to Psalm 127 and you think that as the 
the wayfarers are going from wherever their hometown is up to Jerusalem, that if I've started the sermon this way, this may be a, a deadpan kind of sermon and what kind of sermon to have on Mother's Day than this, but it really isn't. This is incredibly encouraging. Uh, and it's, this is the first psalm, actually, um, that we're going to get to that actually doesn't teach us about the attributes of God or, or his behavior, but actually teaches us a lesson, and it's the primary life lesson for all wayfarers. Listen to the word of God this morning as I read Psalm 127. A song of ascents of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Would you pray with me this morning and ask the Lord to teach us from this? Father, thank you for the opportunity once again to open your word. There is nothing in all of the scripture that you have given to us that is not for our good, for our benefit, for our teaching and our learning. Lord, it all increases our faith in you and encourages us to love you more. Teach us this morning this most basic and foundational principle of life that all wayfarers should understand. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, this psalm, uh, like many of the psalms we've already studied together, has a structure that's important for us um, in understanding how it all uh, fits together and what it all means. Verses 1 and 2 begin the psalm with negative examples to exemplify the point Solomon wants to make to us. Verses 3 to 5 share a metaphor, a simile, and they teach us more emphatically Solomon's one main point. In fact, this is the middle psalm. This is psalm number 8 of the 15 we're going to study. Seven went before us, seven will follow after. The first seven taught us about God's character, who God is, and taught us about God's behavior, what he does for us. This is the first psalm we've been studying that doesn't praise God, but actually teaches us a primary lesson. The other psalms indirectly teach us about God's character and his behavior. This psalm teaches us the specific lesson about all of life. This entire psalm is written to teach us one lesson and the blessings of applying that lesson to the whole of our lives. Now, you're probably going to ask, what, what is it that uh, Solomon is trying to teach us? Well, notice in verse 1 that Solomon writes, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. The very essence of this entire sermon is this. See this slide on your screen this morning. The wayfarer's primary life lesson is this. My life is useless, good for nothing, unless God is in command and control of me. Now, let me say it one more time because some of you may have a start in that. It says the wayfarer's primary life lesson is this. My life is useless, good for nothing, unless God is in command and control of me. That is a startling statement, in fact. But as you're getting up to the temple, and every uh, Jew who would journey from their hometowns and where they're coming from in our, the surrounding area, as they're coming up, they have spent, and as they've shared with their families and everybody that they've been coming with, sometimes we get in, in patterns in our lives. We get into ruts. We get into traditions that we do, and we don't understand what they're for. We just do it because we've always done it that way. And so for even the Jews, as they would go up to the temple, sometimes it was more about the pageantry and the celebration of what these festivals were as they were going up than it was about renewing the relationship with the God who saved them and who is living with them and who they worship on a regular basis. 
And so when we're looking at this, I want you to realize Solomon writes these words. He's not trying to persuade us to work with God. He's not informing us of the benefits of hiring God. He isn't even telling us we will win if we just get out of the way and let God fight our battle for us. Those may be all good points and something that we grow to understand or that we've seen God do in our lives, but that is not the essence of what he's teaching us. The teacher, Scripture tells us, Solomon, is telling us in no uncertain terms that we must completely acknowledge God as our sole authority and commander for our lives to have, a, um, have any meaning and worth. Solomon's telling us that if, if we're going to have purpose and worth in this life, God must be our commander. He must be in control of it. He must be at the center of it. Listen to these verses. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. But just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. Listen to verse 4 now, and it's up here in front of you this morning with me. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. What Solomon is telling us in that verse is, uh, and the first verse of Psalm 127 is this. We're not here partnering with God. God is the one who is building our lives. He's building this world. He's building his church. We're not, we're not, uh, he's not looking for partners, even if we're silent partners. He's looking for folks who are going to sell out completely and totally to him, the architect, the contractor, the builder, the one who's going to do it all we're going to do what he tells us to do, when he tells us to do it, how he tells us to do it, and we don't get to ask why. He commands us. We do it. Why? For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. And Paul picks up on this a theme that the writer in Hebrews writes. He writes this for us in Colossians. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Listen to these words now. Okay, verse 18, the second part of verse 18. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. He didn't stop there. Look at verse 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Verse 20. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. You want to know the purpose of all of Scripture? You want to understand the purpose for which God has created the entire world? It's found right here in verse 18 and verse 20 of Colossians chapter 1, so that he, Jesus himself, will come to have first place in everything. And through Jesus to reconcile all things to himself. That is the purpose of all of creation. And it spans the understanding and the wisdom of every reason Scripture has been written and why the prophets share and why Jesus will return. And it brings all glory to the name of Jesus. He is ultimately the master builder of everything that has happened in all of history, but specifically right now in your life and in mine. Now, verse 2 just broadens our understanding of this first point, that God must be the sole commander and in control of our lives. He says in verse 2, It is vain for you to rise up early, 
to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Now notice this. All our um, efforts, the rising early that is spoken of, all our worrying, the retiring late, all of our struggle and toil, okay, to eat the bread of painful labors is completely worthless and good for nothing, apart, apart from a relationship with God. Now, this relationship, if you're stopping and thinking right here, it sounds like uh, God is just a dictator using his henchman, Jesus, to control every little tiny aspect of our lives. And yet that is not what's going on at all. What the psalmist is writing here is he's writing, if you will, Solomon is writing to all of his children underneath him to the nation of Israel because of a lesson he learned in front of him as David lived in complete worship of his God. And so when Solomon writes these words, what he wants us to understand is that this relationship is not one conquered with the victor's foot upon his neck. Notice it is of love and of grace. Well, how, how is it of love and grace? Up till now, I haven't heard anything. Look at verse 2. For he gives to his beloved, even in his sleep. So what God is saying is, is if you're building your house and God Christ is not at the center of it and he is the one who is developing your character and your relationship with everybody in that house, you're building and wasting your time. It's good for nothing because he's not at the center. And if you're trying to guard the civil duties and watch for the city and try to do some kind of job working out there to take care of everything, and Christ is still not at the center, you're laboring in vain because he's not the one who is actually guarding the city and providing for you. But if you are in a loving, obedient relationship with him, even while you sleep, Christ is moving and working on your behalf. You know, it's great when you get some of these attachments for these machines. We have one at home, and it's a furniture attachment. And when the vacuum works and that attachment works, it is the slickest thing on the planet. It works great. It makes life so easy so that even if... If you think you're working hard, you really are not because it is doing everything for you. And that's the essence of what God is saying. When we are in a loving, obedient, saved relationship with Jesus Christ, even when we are completely at rest and unaware of what's going on, Almighty God, through His Son, is working to bless us and to care for us, to build us and to provide for us. When we willingly submit our will to God and come through forgiveness to Jesus, we experience incredible love and grace. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Ephesians, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to the fullness of Almighty God." Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Does that sound like a conqueror who's about ready to snuff out um, those that he has triumphed over with just a twist of his ankle and put them under his boot or throw them into bondage and slavery and think nothing of them? No, this is Almighty God, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, who has every right to do that to us, but who chose to die on the cross in your place and in mine to take away our sin because of his amazing, incredible love. And if we will come to him and submit to him and trust him, 
receive his forgiveness and trust him as our savior, then we too will come to submit to him. He will be our commander and our controller. Now notice verse 3. Verse 3 takes us to the example of the house being built in verse 1. It takes us back there. Why does someone build a house? Well, to start and to build, typically, a family. Well, notice one of God's graces to those are His beloved. Remember, this isn't that, that domineering, um, victor type of, of conqueror uh, relationship. This is a loving relationship where we come to our God, our King, our Savior, and He calls us His beloved. While we're asleep, God gives to us. While we are resting, God gives to us. While we're, we're doing what he has asked of us, he fills in the gap and gives us grace that we didn't even think of or deserve. What does God give and no one else can give? But children. Remember, this is a Jewish poem. This isn't something that an American has written. Yesterday I sat down and I, I was reading through Rudyard Kipling again, one of England's. In fact, they call him their greatest writer of the 20th century. Now, reading some of his works, this doesn't have anything to do with us and in our mindset. This is a Jewish poem expressing Jewish ideas and Jewish thoughts. And Jewish poems use particular literary techniques. And one is parallelism. Certain words in one sentence are parallel either to the end of the sentence or in another. And so what I want you to realize right here is certain words will prove certain points. So the word in verse 3, the word children, which actually means sons, parallels fruit of the womb. Okay? These are God's gifts. In the second part of that verse, gift, which means actually inheritance, parallels reward at the very end, which means wages. This simply means, in this Jewish poem, that as God's obedient, beloved children, he loves to give us good things, one of which is children, which are an incredible blessing to fill the house he is building through us to glorify him. Look at verse 4. Here's the simile now and these metaphors that I was talking about. Like arrows. Remember, similes are like and as. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are, remember, what are these incredible gifts that God gives to us as we seek to obey him that he builds our house with? Children. These arrows are children of our youth. And the warrior's arrows parallel the children of our youth. Verse 5 says, How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. If you're not an archer and you don't know anything about archery, usually a, a quiver is just that thing that you strap over your shoulder or you carry with you on the side of your belt and it holds all of the arrows. And it's, you know, if you ever go shooting, you don't go out with one arrow, shoot at the target, go down, get the arrow, come back, shoot again. You usually have about five to 10, maybe even 20 arrows that you keep in a quiver. Why? Because you want to get up, just like if you were shooting a gun, you want to kind of sight yourself in and you want several of them at one time to be able to do it. So here, what God is saying is these children that are a gift from God who are building your house as this incredible blessing and these graces to you, when your house is full of children, they're like these arrows. Why would a warrior need arrows? But to defend himself, to work and build the kingdom, to protect the house that's being built. And notice that's exactly what's happening in verse 5. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. The gate for a Jew was the place to conduct business and some minor small claims court stuff and other civil litigation. Typically in that society, the young men who were coming of age would go with their father to watch and to learn how business was done and eventually be able to take over dad's business for him. But when fathers would get older, sometimes the younger sons of another man would like to try to deal with intimidation. But when that couldn't happen because the quiver of a man uh, was with him and all of his sons would stand up with him against that intimidator, 
nothing would be able to prevent them from winning their case. God wanted to make sure that we were secure, that his future in us was secure, that God has secured his and our lives. Okay, so we're looking at Psalm 127. What does that have anything to do with us today? Really, what does that have anything to do with us? Well, do you remember the passages in Matthew and in Luke? Let me read them for you. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 29. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act to them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house, and it fell. Great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. That was Matthew 7, 24 to 29. Now, the only other gospel that actually has the same account but in a different view is Luke. So in Luke chapter 6, verses 49, uh, 46 to 49, it says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house, and he could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it, and immediately it collapsed. And the ruin of that house was great. What's interesting is both of these passages come from each of the gospel writer's account of what Jesus was teaching kingdom principles. This is what is at the very end of the Beatitudes in both of the accounts, Matthews and Luke's. So at the very end of all of this teaching that Jesus has already done from the side of the mountain, he gets up and he leaves, but before he gets up and leaves, he sums everything up with this statement to them. Everything that I have just said, all that I have taught you about Almighty God, all that I am teaching you now about this relationship with him, what good does it do you? If it just sounds neat, it's an interesting story, it kept you busy for an hour, it entertained you, but you didn't do any single thing about it. You didn't even put it into practice. It will accomplish you absolutely nothing. So there's four things that I want to share with you this morning about everything from Psalm 127 and these two passages. Mike, if you could put up number one for me, thank you. Knowing that you need to receive forgiveness from Jesus to be saved and believing that Jesus is Almighty God the Son is one thing. But you need to humble yourself and actually ask Jesus to forgive your sins and to save you. If you don't do that, everything you are doing that has to do with God is just religious banter and behavior and is good for nothing. It's like vacuuming with a vacuum that doesn't actually work. It won't save you. Only a relationship with Jesus, with Jesus, through his forgiveness, will save you and make you a child of God the Father. That is when he will call you his beloved. I'm going to repeat that last part. Only a relationship with Jesus through his forgiveness will save you and make you a child of God the Father. That is when he will call you his beloved. I've shared this illustration with you before. You can sit in a church. You can listen to all these messages. You can talk with me and hang out with me and call me your friend. But that is not going to make you a disciple of Christ. Neither will if you live, sleep, eat, park yourself in your garage, make you a car. Just hanging around and playing Christian doesn't make you a disciple of Jesus. Only, only, only 
a personal relationship with Jesus through his forgiveness will it save you and make you a child of God the Father. That's when he will call you his beloved. Number two, hearing God's word and promises and instruction is good for nothing and absolutely worthless if you do not actually obey and apply what the Bible tells us to do. In fact, it's like having a billion dollar bank account and then going out and borrowing $20 every time you need some money from your family and friends all the time. Use the resources you have. They will never run out and you won't be able to use them all. Stop living a poor life just because you think you know better than God. In fact, I'm going to challenge you with something. If you keep choosing to know better it is vain than God, for you to rise up. If you keep choosing to know better than God, what's really going to happen is you are actually putting yourself above Jesus Christ, and I'm going to challenge that you might not be saved. You don't. That's why God sent his son to show us, help us, and hold us accountable to how we should live as children of the king. Hearing God's word and promises and instructions is good for nothing and worthless if you do not actually obey and apply what the Bible tells us to do. This morning, number two is this. Do it. Don't just hear God's word. James tells us, don't be hearers only, but apply it, practice it to your life. Number three, Remember I said I'm going to challenge your salvation? If we choose to, number three is this, if we choose to disregard Jesus and his salvation, and if we choose to disregard his word and choose not to obey it, can we actually say we're saved? Can we actually say we're saved if the one who has saved us says, this is what I want you to do, and we say, oh, no thanks, I'm, I'm good, I've got it all under control. No, from the passages that we have just been given from Psalm 127 and then specifically from Luke and from Matthew, he says, we are the men who build our lives on the sand and how great is our destruction when the storms of life come, but even more importantly, how great is the destruction. It is eternal and complete when we stand before God the Father at the end of our lives in time and he says to us, go away for I never knew you. He says, those who have ears to hear, let them hear, but obey my word. Number three, if we choose to disregard Jesus and his salvation, and if we choose to disregard his word and don't obey it, we cannot say that we are saved. And my last one, number four. If we will learn this primary life lesson of the wayfarer, and submit to God loving and God's loving and gracious commands and his control willingly and obey his instructions, promises, and commands, we will live and we will learn the way of wisdom and we will prosper and be blessed. I'm going to say that one more time. If we will learn this primary life lesson of the wayfarer and submit to God who is loving and gracious, who commands and controls, and we willingly obey his instructions, promises, and commands, we will learn and live the way of wisdom, and we will prosper and be blessed. This primary life lesson is to willingly submit to Almighty God and to obey his word. There is no greater primary lesson. In fact, Solomon, who's the writer of this particular psalm, sums it up because they actually attribute this psalm possibly to the same time that he was writing the book of Ecclesiastes. And as he was writing the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 13, he sums everything up, is to know, have a relationship with your creator, to obey him, and to walk after him humbly. Simply put, it's to let God be the center of our lives, commanding and controlling us in a loving, obedient relationship. 
you know, so many people never get past this primary life lesson. They play the game, but in playing the game, it's worthless and good for nothing because playing the game doesn't make you anything but a game player. The only way you become beloved is when you simply come before Jesus, bow before him, ask him to forgive you of your sin and obey his word. When Jesus becomes your commander and the controller of your life, you then become his beloved. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you that you continually remind us, continue to remind us of things that we walk away from too quickly and too easily, but remind us that we are not our own and that the only way that we will live a successful, complete, and blessed life is when you are the commander and controller of all that we are. Lord, we do love you. And where we struggle against that, I pray that you would give us grace and power. And Lord, humble our spirits, I pray. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.